Hi guys! Today we'll be recapping a story called Youngest Princess. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps us a lot. Enjoy! As the story opens, the High Mage is getting a report in her office when she suddenly starts to feel exhausted. The Mage stops her report and leaves to ensure that the High Mage takes a break, as she is an important figure in their kingdom. Just as she's about to hit the hay after a long bath, a magical rune starts glowing beneath her bed. She is unable to breathe or utilize her magic, and in an instant, she vanishes. An old sage once prophesied to the royal family of Hyperion that the kingdom would be bathed in everlasting glory the moment a third star appeared. In a Hyperion empire, the sun represents the emperor, the moon the empress, and the stars the prince and princess. Thus, the third star signifies the empire's third child. However, the Hyperion family had trouble bearing a third child for hundreds of generations, until a princess was born, and the birth caused chaos across the continent. Princess Anisha Rodgo Hyperion is the third child in the line. She is just six months old, yet she remembers her former life as the High Priest, one of the three renowned rulers of the magical Sky Kingdom, Archus, and noted genius. She still doesn't understand the mysterious magic rune, but she does realize that it seals away her magic. To make matters worse, she is now a princess cherished by the Hyperion Kingdom, so she realizes that returning to Archus when she grows up will be impossible. So she resolves to accept her fate. Having an adult's mind trapped in a baby's body, though, makes her feel somewhat uneasy, and her maid perceives her facial expression as a state of emergency. Diaper change, food, and all the means the servants are trying to entertain her are driving her crazy. But she knows that if she screams, they would be discouraged, so she breaks into a smile, making them fall for her. Then her stern father walks in, and all it takes is her smile to light up his mood. Initially, Emperor Rodgo isn't really fond of Anisha. He merely drops by occasionally to see whether she's okay. And the same is true for her twin prince brothers, who drop by only when they want to skip their tedious lessons. After receiving unwelcome treatment from her new family, she resolves to take revenge, and her first target is her father, Rodgo. It's been days since the Emperor last checked on her, so when the time comes, she offers him the most adorable baby eyes. However, this only makes the Emperor worried, so he promptly orders a doctor. Following the doctor's confirmation that Anisha is perfectly well and merely fond of him, the Emperor begins paying her frequent visits and showering her with gifts. This behavior confuses the staff, who have never seen the Emperor act so affectionately toward anyone, not even the two princes. One day, Rodgo tries to touch Anisha and hesitates since his hand is covered in people's blood. But his defenses begin to break when his adorable daughter cuddles up to him, and from that moment on, Anisha's first prisoner is under control. After that day, everything changes as the Emperor starts to show signs of undying love for his daughter. OMG, the once Zundere father is now a simp, cutie. Of course, Anisha did not forget to show her father some fan service in a very cute style that goes straight to her father's heart. <laughs> Everybody is starting to adjust to the Emperor's new side, including the servants. They meticulously report to him every day, making sure he knows everything. Even her attempt to roll over is a huge thing. Next, the Emperor consults the royal painter on the state of the princess's portrait, and Anisha gives her stamp of approval, but the Emperor clearly isn't happy about it. The Emperor emits a cold attitude, not liking the portrait, because it doesn't do credit to his daughter's charms, driving the painter to tremble in fear as he begs forgiveness. It would not be surprising if the Emperor jails the painter, considering he has already jailed one innocent person due to her. So Anisha must immediately begin her rescue operation. First, capture the Emperor's attention, then stir him up a little by demanding something until he realizes that she likes the painting. Step three is to demonstrate her undying love for it, and finally, finish it off with an embrace. The Emperor's mood improves, and the life of the royal painter is spared! <laughs> that night, the two princes are getting bored, so they decide to pay a visit to their little sister. They start talking about the increased royal security after an assassination attempt by an assassin, who disguised herself as a maid and tried to kill Anisha. When they get close to Anisha's room, they discover the door is open, so they rush inside to find all the servants dead and the princess no longer in her crib. The Hyperion Empire is the most powerful nation on the continent, and many nations resent them for ruling over them and collecting taxes from them. And so her birth as the third star princess is a major setback for those who detest the Hyperion family, which is why many are trying to have her killed. Upon waking up in her maid's arms, who is frantically running, Anisha realizes that another assassin is undoubtedly attempting to kill her. 
can I just add that the maid totally deserves a raise? Just as the maid is about to reach the hidden entrance, the assassin comes into play. So Anisha has no choice but to use her limited magic to distract the assassin long enough for the guards to reach them. As the assassin rushes towards Anisha, blood begins to stain the floor, signaling that the assassin has been killed by the twins, who arrive in time to save her. The Empire's first and second stars were born as twins, with Hellard as the eldest, who looks exactly like their father. A violent character with amazing swordsmanship who has already begun accompanying their father to battle, and he is rumored to be the expected successor to the throne. The second prince, Rochiel, takes after their mother, the late Empress, in appearance. He is known to be more sophisticated and icy than his brother Hellard, and though swordsmanship is also one of his strengths, he despises physical exertion. However, despite their opposite characteristics, the twins share one trait. They're both psychos. As we all know, the twins aren't particularly fond of Anisha, but this changes following the first assassination attempt. That night, the assassin disguised as a maid wraps a pillow around the helpless Anisha until she can't breathe. When she opens her eyes, she sees Hellard, who has blood on his face and is removing the cushion from her face. Rochelle decides to leave everything to the guards now that Anisha is safe, fearing that Anisha will throw a fit, but Hellard believes it will be entertaining, so they test it by sticking their heads in the crib. Anisha, on the other hand, has no idea what's going on until she realizes that these two have just saved her life. The twins are amazed that their little sister isn't crying after what happened to her, while Anisha sees this as her chance to win over her brothers. And she immediately succeeds in winning over the insane twins by relying on her strongest suit, her adorable baby face. They are now slaves to her cuteness. Following that day, they start paying her visits. Initially, they display their adoration with they display their adoration in a too violent manner, threatening her like a toy as they throw her up in the air and pinch her cheeks. But eventually, they learn to be gentle with her. After her brothers rescue her once more, Anisha rewards them with her precious smile. But Hellard couldn't help but notice that she isn't crying again this time. Rochiel can only think of one reason, and that is because she is special. Hellard becomes envious as he begins to cuddle Anisha, and the two begin to argue over who will carry the adorable baby as the soldiers arrive too late. Rochiel shoots Hellard a glance that suggests he should punish the incompetent guards with his terrifying nature. The guards fall on their knees, pleading with Prince Hellard to forgive them, but the prince reminds them how special their sister is and makes it clear that he has no intention of sparing their lives. However, killing them would be too easy, and so the two psychos are looking forward to letting their younger sister choose the punishment. Like, how? She can't even speak yet! Anisha is aware of the guard's sincere devotion for her, and she knows that they would be helpless against the assassin today if it weren't for the twins. But since she was in danger, she believes that 10 days in jail would be a reasonable punishment for them. Now, her dilemma is figuring out how to express this to her brothers, so she uses her hands to show them 10 fingers. But Hellard sees this as a very violent punishment, which is to cut off the guard's 10 fingers. Anisha goes into a panic and waves her hands, leading Hellard to think she wants to cut their arms. Then she extends her entire arm to describe handcuffs, but this only convinces Hellard that she wants to slice the guards' throats. <laughs> then, Rochelle realizes that Anisha's wiggling body suggests that she probably wants to cut off their limbs. There is definitely no ordinary brother in this family. <laughs> Hellard draws his sword, leaving Anisha with no option but to let out a weeping cry. So while Hellard freaks out, Rochelle thankfully realizes that Anisha dislikes the sword, and as soon as Hellard sheaths his blade, Anisha immediately stops sobbing. After Hellard sees Anisha make the most endearing, sad expression, he decides to let the guards go for the time being. Our princess has saved lives once again. Phew! Meanwhile, in Arches, the left mage, Baluin, learns of a new source of magic uncovered in the Hyperion Empire, which they assume has something to do with the newborn princess. He wants to find out more, as he is desperate for information on their missing high mage. So our baby girl basically got reincarnated in the same world. Finally, the day arrives when Anisha is able to call her father Dada, and he is so surprised to hear the word that it keeps ringing in his head. The Emperor then turns to the terrified maids to ensure he heard correctly, and they congratulate him on the princess's first word. Anisha repeats herself, growing increasingly concerned as the Emperor shows no sign of responding, when he is actually so overjoyed that he has declared today a national holiday! <laughs> The holiday was eventually cancelled thanks to the Hyperion royal advisors, who risked their lives to stop the Emperor. 
Rodgo has already declared the princess's first rollover a holiday, and they are concerned that if he continues to do so, all 365 days will become holidays. The love of the father. <laughs> Today, the Emperor summons all high-ranking nobles, and while they wait, they express their gratitude that the holiday proposal has been cancelled, and they begin to wonder when they will finally see the princess. However, their attention is drawn to one noble who spots the table's red cloth, which represents bloodshed, and they begin to suspect that the Emperor intends to kill them for opposing his plans. Just then, the Emperor shows up with the twins, but it is the princess who catches their attention. As everyone watches in disbelief, the Emperor sets Anisha on the long table and walks over to the other side, smiling and encouraging his daughter to crawl to him. No one can believe this is the same person who is supposedly a beast! After Anisha does her part and crawls up to her father, the Emperor asks for the noble's thoughts on his genius daughter. At last, the nobility figures out that the meeting is just the Emperor showing off his daughter's crawling abilities, so they begin to lavish her with praise, much to the Emperor's satisfaction. Next, he shares the exciting news that the princess's first birthday is just around the corner and asks that they extend an invitation to every noble family on the entire continent. The capital city of Hyperion begins its celebration, and the twins visit a shop that sells a limited edition jewelry set marking the princess's birthday. Hellard purchases two of everything, and Rochelle buys three. Care to guess why Rochelle purchased a total of three each? The first set is for gifting. The second is for him to keep, and the third is to display. <laughs> and the city's lively celebration of Anisha's birthday has made the twins very proud. Meanwhile, Anisha is finally able to practice walking, and the maids express their excitement for her upcoming birthday after a brief break. She is then startled to learn that the mysterious Arches Kingdom has agreed to attend her birthday party. Arches is a tiny nation in the sky where the mages who live don't age due to the magical powers of the land and the kingdom is deeply influential across the continent due to its reputation as the birthplace of magic. The three mages that rule Arches are Beluin, the left mage, who is in charge of their diplomatic relations, Noxita, the right mage, who is in charge of the legal system, and finally, we have the high mage, the most powerful mage in Arches, endowed with unparalleled magical might. Lastly, because Arches is a secretive nation, they have never sent delegations to other nations until now, which alarms Anisha. Even though her powers are weak, she is still concerned that Arches will discover her true identity, leading to an inevitable war. Yeah, that's probably going to happen given that she's the third star that Hyperion family was foretold to have, and she's also a valuable ruler of Arches. Noxita is Arches's designated representative for Anisha's birthday celebration, but he appears uninterested and only interested in seeing the High Mage. If she is indeed dead, he vows to resurrect her. When Beluan notices that Noxita is quite concerned, he explains that his trip to Hyperion is not in vain. Rather, he wants Noxita to test whether or not he can perceive the High Mage's magic in the location where they discovered a new source of magic. Additionally, Beluan guarantees Noxita that the High Mage is still alive and that they will find her no matter what. The princess's birthday has finally arrived, and while they prepare Anisha for the occasion, the maid mentions that the young prince of Jadkar will be present, which Anisha finds intriguing. But before the maid can say anything else, the twins arrive to check on their adorable little sister. Because of the Jadkar Kingdom's war for the throne, they throw the Jadkar prince to Hyperion as a pawn, so the twins plan to keep the prince away from Anisha. Anisha knows that Jadkar is a kingdom in the Cold Mountains, and she can already tell that he won't be treated well in Hyperion since he's being used as a pawn. At last, she's all dressed up and her brothers can't help but be smitten. Anisha is being carried by Rochiel when the Emperor shows up and swiftly takes her away from the brothers. As the three lads exchange angry looks, Rodgo teases the twins, telling them that they should become Emperors if they want to get Anisha from him. <laughs> then, to demonstrate the might of the Empire, he orders the twins to behave themselves, a command that they joyfully comply with. They finally open up the door to the terrace where the public can glimpse the princess for the first time. The sight and sound of so many cheers shock Anisha, and she quickly comes to the realization that the entire Harperian nation has lost its mind, not just her family. She can't disappoint those who love her at this point, so she smiles and waves her hand, which the boys think is adorable. Then, out of nowhere, two long-range magic arrows try to assault them, but the attacks are rendered ineffective due to the Empire's magical barrier. The Emperor only calls for the twins' names, and they already know what to do. The Emperor controls the Empire's barrier, which allows the twins to teleport. 
Just as Anisha is thinking about how to improve the shield, her brothers materialize back, having already captured the attackers. The twins execute them on the spot, and the Emperor seizes the chance to declare that regardless of strategy, anyone attempting to eliminate their precious third star must be prepared to die, as there is no other way out. They attack, they protect, but most importantly, they have Anisha's back. The banquet night starts when the Emperor walks in holding Anisha and the twins by his side. The moment they settle into their royal seats, the nobility begins to form a queue to offer presents. A collection so vast that the Emperor could construct an annex to house them all. Afterwards, the nobility finds it amazing as an archous mage approaches, but what makes Anisha so startled is that the mage is Noxida, which makes her nervous. As soon as the Emperor notices this, he takes Anisha's hand and looks into her eyes to ask for her suggestions on how to take out the mage responsible for her low mood. Anisha quickly smiles to pacify her father, and it surely works wonders. More than just a physical token, Arches provided a plan for an official cultural exchange with Hyperion as their present. Noxida notifies the Emperor of their proposal to send mages to Hyperion to share their magic in exchange for learning about Hyperion's culture, which the Emperor greatly approves. Anisha is relieved to have survived the night, and when she sees Noxita looking at her, she waves goodbye, causing Noxita to blush. Oh, our baby has also captured a mage! As the Prince of Jadkar makes his way down the aisle to present his gift, the nobles cast him sidelong glances and mutter insults his way. Anisha, though, recognizes the lifeless eyes in the prince as she did in Noxita and Belawan when she first met them, and she is certain that the prince will undoubtedly cause trouble in the future if he's not properly guided. The prince kneels and stutters his introduction as Prince Cahill, drawing scorn from nobles who mock him for being a royal ignorant of the Empire's language. But the young prince continues and presents the princess with a shimmering white hide of wool. Anisha feels bad for the prince, so she makes sure to show how much she adores the prince's present. However, there is one person who is not pleased with her overblown enthusiasm, and that is her father, who looks scary when he's jealous. If this continues, the Emperor may end up killing the innocent prince, so she employs her weapon, screaming her love for her father, dazzling those adorable baby eyes, and embracing him. Her charm is definitely stronger than her magic. <laughs> the Emperor eventually calms down and accepts Prince Cahill's gift and the night continues with the other nations presenting their gifts. Seeing that the princess is clearly exhausted, the emperor gives the twins the task of escorting her to her room. Anisha is surprised to find the white fur Prince Cahill gave her already in her room and admits that the emperor is a wonderful father for not throwing it away simply because she likes it. What amazes her even more is the twins' present of a pair of swords to her, which is clearly overkill for a one-year-old, but she likes it nonetheless and bestows them with her adorable smile. To end her day, her maid has put her to bed, but she awakens in the middle of the night to find that all her maids have passed out. Anisha concludes that magic makes the maids unconscious, and the person responsible appears. Thankfully, not an assassin, but Noxita. He then asks the one-year-old if she knows where the high mage is. He starts to describe her to Anisha, but what really gets to her is his saddened expression and how he says the high mage is important to him. It reminds her of the first time she found Noxita, so lifeless in the dirtiest and most dangerous area. But seeing the light in his dark green eyes, she helped him get through life, and Noxita dedicated his life to her. She apologizes and pats his cheeks as if to console him, making him want to kidnap her more. <laughs> he realizes he cannot take the princess with him, but he assures her that he will return before bidding her farewell for the time being. Meanwhile, in Rushfelt Manor, the Countess is sorting through the mail she received that day and comes upon one with the royal family seal, which she reads with so much excitement that she quickly visits the Empire the next day. Despite her pride as a great educator who graduated top-notch from Helenor Academy and the continent's premier school, she eagerly accepts the Emperor's invitation without hesitation. The Emperor goes on to explain that she'll be in charge of the Princess's education and proudly tells her that there won't be much to teach because his little girl is quite intelligent. This leads the Countess to believe that the rumors are true because he is blinded by his love for the princess. But a child is still a child, and she is certain that the princess's temperament won't be easy to deal with. Hey lady, wait until you meet our baby girl! Speaking of our baby girl, Anisha entices Countess Rushfeld with her charming demeanor as she attempts to walk to her father. The Emperor's murderous aura quickly fades as he embraces his daughter, and the Countess finds it difficult to believe she is witnessing the Emperor's other side. 
she shows the Emperor her teaching aids, both age-appropriate and more advanced, which she plans to use as the princess progresses. However, while she is explaining to the Emperor, Anisha goes to the table, slides the cubes, and solves the puzzle. The Countess is so shocked, finally agreeing that the princess is indeed a genius and an exceptional talent that their world will never witness again, making the Emperor give her a I told you so look. <laughs> As a result, the Countess provides her with fairy tale books to read, but she's more interested in magic books and complains about how hard it is to pretend to be normal. She wakes up that night in her father's arms, who's with the twins. Her father is telling her goodbye and informs her that he and Hellard are going on a pearl digging expedition and will return before her second birthday, while Rochiel promises to watch after her while they're gone. Just before they leave, her father kisses her and Hellard squeezes her, promising to bring her the biggest pearl in the world. Are they really taking down a kingdom for pearls? I cannot with this family. <laughs> when she awakens the next day, Rochiel gives her a detailed account of how Rodgo and Hellard went to war, including how the assassination attempts had vanished after her birthday. But Rodgo was adamant about carrying out his declaration of war. Even though Rochiel is a young prince acting as emperor at the palace, no one voiced dissatisfaction. This is because the ministers trust the Hyperion family's extraordinary intelligence better than anyone else. And because Rochiel was friendlier than Rodgo, some nobles even liked the way he treated them. This is how the time went by, and now that she is nearly two years old, she has finally mastered walking after months of stumbling, and despite her imperfect pronunciation, she can carry on a decent conversation thanks to Countess Ruschfeld's teachings. She tells the maid she's going on a picnic because she finished her task early that day. The weather is lovely, and she can almost feel the wind as she walks outside. Suddenly, she hears one of the maids scolding someone, and she comes to a halt when she sees the lad and recognizes him as the boy who gave her wolf fur at the party and extends her hand to him, inviting him to join her. Since he doesn't react, she tugs him along with her, while the maid is concerned that if the emperor or the twin princes find out, they will be in trouble. Now she sits next to him, observing his appearance and taking note of his fearless eyes. He reminds her of the left and right mages, which makes her worried about him. She decides to give him food because he probably doesn't get enough. Just as she's about to open the basket, he approaches her and says he'll do it, which surprises her because he's not stuttering this time. Jadkar is a small nation located in the far north of the continent, within the snowy mountains. And the nation's eternal snow is considered to be the work of the spirits of snow, giving Jadkar power and mystery. However, the royal family of this nation is a total mess. The king is ill and bedridden, and his mistress, Mrs. Cartina, and her son are manipulating him. The queen died while giving birth to Prince Cahill, who was the legitimate heir to the throne. But because the mistress wanted her own son to inherit the throne, Cahill was removed as heir and given away to the Hyperion Empire. His frail appearance and lack of clothing are clear signs that Cahill was mistreated. He is also known to have difficulty speaking as a result of his family's abuse. However, this appears to be more inaccurate now that Anisha sees him speaking wonderfully. She suspects he's only acting stupid so that no one will take him seriously and believes that if he could just gain some weight, he would look normal. But she knows Cahill will not be treated well in Hyperion, so she gives him her hair accessory, which is probably worth millions, and wishes for him to run away and live freely somewhere. When he doesn't answer, she puts it in his hand and encourages him to be free. And just as he's about to tell her something, the maid interrupts them to eat, and the prince walks away without saying anything. Anisha is skilled at everything but drawing. So today in Rochiel's office, Anisha tries her hardest to draw the basket of fruit, but she fails miserably. Rochiel notices her problem and assists her by making a sketch she can replicate, which she greatly appreciates because it is so different from how Hellard previously helped her. Hellard saw that she was sketching an apple that day, so he decided to smash the reference apple so it would appear like her artwork. Right, the reference must adjust to his baby sister's drawing. <laughs> Speaking of her brother Hellard, he and their father have managed to overthrow the Quantea Empire, and the king is now escaping, leaving his entire kingdom in ruins. He and his family use the secret route, and he now wishes he hadn't followed Hyperion's resistance organization and offered to kill the princess at his command. It seems the Emperor isn't just randomly invading Quantea for their pearls, the kingdom is actually involved in the assassinations. No one can escape Emperor Rodgo's fury, and the entire royal family has been seized from their hidden route, tied up, and returned to Quantia's palace. Rodgo sits on the throne, then orders his troops to pull the queen closer to him. The queen resists because she fears being molested by Rodgo. Like, duh, this daddy is merely interested in the pearl necklace she is wearing, as it is the famous Quantia's tears. 
Now he tells his troops to search the palace for the perfect present for their princess, Anisha. But Hellard has already found what he thinks she'll love, a massive pearl ball. This father-son duo is really amusing and cute. Then the emperor gets a highly urgent message. Well, not really. It is simply a letter from Anisha expressing her longing for the two of them. The emperor gets to his feet, orders everyone to clean up, and then mercilessly executes the king so he may return home quickly. Well, he obviously messed with the wrong empire, so he deserves it. Time has passed, and although neither Rodgo nor Hellard are physically present, the entire kingdom is celebrating Anisha's second birthday with great spirit. She receives numerous gifts from other countries, while Rocio renovated the palace library as his birthday gift to her. Also, she can now use her magic just enough to produce a puddle, but she decides to live normally without using magic, at least until she regains more of her power, which she eagerly awaits. Preceding the Emperor's arrival, a concerned Countess Rochefeld visits Prince Rochiel's office, expressing her concern that Princess Anisha may have forgotten the faces of the Emperor and Prince Hellard after being away for six months. Considering her insane brother, this is probably good news for him. Rochiel then carries his baby sister, asking if she recalls their father in Hellard's face. But before she can respond, he assures her that she shouldn't be concerned if she doesn't. His expression is one of pure joy, and Anisha chooses to play along by acting as if she can't recognize them. Such a selfish, cute brother. At long last, the Emperor, Prince Hellard, and their army have returned, and the entire kingdom is rejoicing at their arrival. At the palace's entry, Prince Rochiel, holding Princess Anisha, greets them, and the Emperor immediately embraces Anisha. Hellard then does the same, but with more smooching. <laughs> this duo wastes no time in presenting their gifts to Anisha, a massive pearl from Hellard and a crown from their father. As they eagerly await Anisha's show of happiness, they are taken aback when she hides behind Rochiel and completely forgets about them. You guys hear that? Two hearts have just stopped beating so cruel. <laughs> they are currently discussing the matter within the palace, and while the Ember and Hellard appear to be quite concerned, Rochiel finds it very amusing. Rochiel goes on to explain that forgetting the faces of the people they haven't seen for a long time is normal for babies, which is something the two boys can't accept. They take turns introducing themselves to Anisha, which makes her feel so lightheaded, so Rochiel stops them, reminding them not to press the baby too hard, and convinces them that she will remember them in time. Hellard is so irritated by Rochiel's casual comments, yet he can't bring himself to curse in front of Anisha, even though he wants to. <laughs> Cutie. However, Hellard is not the only one who is furious. The Emperor threatens Rochiel with deportation to Quantea, given that the kingdom there needs a new governor. Rochiel gets shivers, thinking of staying there alone without his baby sister. So he stops teasing them and finally informs them of Countess Rouchefeld's solution. Living with Anisha for a while will be necessary until she starts to remember them. The three boys who are staring at her are probably unsure how to share Anisha's time, and so the Emperor takes the initiative and takes her first. He leaves with Anisha, leaving poor Hellard. The Emperor brings Anisha to his office, which is her first visit given that she usually stays at her own palace. Suddenly, a swarm of servants bearing mountains of paperwork for the Emperor arrives. Seeing so much work makes her dizzy because it reminds her of the excessive workload she had to do while she was still the High Mage. To brighten Anisha's mood, the Emperor wants to give her an apple, but there's a catch. She has to call him Daddy first. She's like a small puppy. <laughs> the Emperor then begins the paperwork, and Anisha discovers that nobles attempted to reform the tax system while the Emperor was away, but Rochiel stopped them. Can't lie, I want Rochiel to become the Emperor. And now that the Emperor has returned, the royal advisor advises that it is now time to establish a date for the Archist diplomats to enter Hyperion. The Emperor has planned it for a month from now, which Anisha thinks is okay. As long as Noxita and Baluan aren't coming with the mages, she's confident she can fool anyone. The Emperor then looks at Anisha and surprises her by summoning the mage to see if he can restore her memory. She can't be inspected by a mage, since it would be too obvious that she possesses magical abilities. See? You got yourself into trouble! Del Heron, the palace's head mage, enters, and Anisha recognizes him as a man born with remarkable magical abilities who worked hard to achieve his position. Del is relieved to have prepared a spell that aids in memory recovery, and he feels confident that he can help the princess. However, in order to do so, he must examine Anisha's condition by holding her hand, which our girl strongly opposes, as she should. Time for her to act of throwing tantrums and crying to her father about how she doesn't like magic, but none of it works against the Emperor, so as a punishment, she begins to get angry, wrecking her poor father's heart again. 
With no other option, Anisha surrenders to the head mage, who looks at her fearfully, as he already knows that she is far stronger than the twins, even without assessing her powers. Upon touching Anisha's hand, he is surprised and tells the Emperor that the young princess possesses sufficient magical abilities to become a mage. Well, she's more than that! As Del keeps digging, he finds out that Anisha's power is being sealed off inside her, and to prevent Del from informing the Emperor, she is forced to use her magic. Anisha paused time for everyone but Del, expressing that he must keep her powers a secret. After that, Anisha shuts off her magic, while Del is still so confused since only the most powerful magicians are capable of creating such powerful magic. Right at that moment, Anisha starts to gasp for air. Blood starts coming out of her mouth, and she passes out. She is currently in her room, and when the palace doctor examined her, it appears that Anisha suffered internal injuries as a result of sudden magic depletion. Well, she did stop the time, so... The doctor has pledged to do everything in his power to save Anisha, who is in critical condition. But that is not an option for the Emperor. He does not want the Doctor to do everything he can, but he has to save his daughter no matter what. When Anisha awakens, her brothers are there to greet her with a hug, and Hellard is so happy when she breaks the act and says she remembers him. She then recalls using her sealed up magic to pause time for three seconds, and given that she passed out during the evaluation, she assumes that the Emperor must have already killed Del. She feels terrible and begins to cry since the Head Mage is dead because of her but she is shocked that they haven't killed him yet. Her family is actually waiting for her to wake up before making a decision because the mage promised to fulfill his first vow to her. Three vows have been handed down through the ages. These are vows made by those in positions of power to dedicate themselves to someone. The first vow wages the person's personal power, the second their heart, and the third their soul to whom they want to pledge. It is a serious matter, which is probably why they haven't killed Del yet. And looking at her brothers, it looks like Del actually kept her powers a secret. Hellard informs Anisha that she can refuse the pledge if she so desires, and while Rochiel acknowledges that Del could be an excellent magic teacher for her, he agrees with Hellard. The twins swear to protect her and will get their hands dirty for her, urging her not to learn magic because they are afraid she may faint again. Still, little sister is dead on learning magic. She enchants the twins once more with her charming smile and claims that she wants to protect them, and they can't help but embrace her. Meanwhile, word of her awakening reaches her father, who is now rushing to meet her. Rodgo's mother died shortly after giving birth to him, and he is known to be a murderer as a result, so his childhood wasn't great. However, Rodgo's Hyperion blood is thicker than anyone else's, and he displayed no guilt while sitting on the throne, soaked in his family's blood. He reasons that being the strongest of the bunch, it is only fair that he be the Emperor, so showing affection to anyone is really not in his vocabulary. But that changed when Princess Anisha was born. Just as he was conceived by killing his mother, the Empress died shortly after giving birth to the princess. He feels the connection to her because of this, but he never intended to express worthless sentiments to the princess. But somehow he ends up loving her and becoming his everything. The Emperor, entering Anisha's room and instantly kneeling down to kiss her hand, makes her feel guilty, knowing that he must have been upset with himself for what happened to her. Her father's face lights up with relief as she offers him the biggest hug and calls him Daddy, suggesting that she remembered his identity. She then argues to her father that she wants to study magic from Del, and the Emperor, just like how the twins reacted earlier, is opposed to the notion because it may be dangerous for her. Our not-so-innocent baby here uses her powers again by tilting her head slightly, using those puppy eyes, and asking her father with a weeping tone if she's truly not permitted to do magic. So, there you have it. The princess's wish is the Emperor's command. After the Emperor has agreed, he summons the head mage to make his first vow to the princess. Del chants his vow while on his knees, offering to pass over the authority of his power to the princess, which Anisha gratefully accepts. Del doesn't waste time after making the vow and immediately requests a private chat with Anisha, which the Emperor grants, leaving the two of them in her room. Anisha looks stunned when Del asks her if she is the High Mage, but from his serious expression, it appears that he is already convinced of her identity. He then reveals that they previously met at Helenor when she was studying at the Academy and he was working as a teacher, and that seeing her distinctive gold-colored magic and high-level magic yesterday is what makes him so sure. And the fact that the investigators from Archus's mage unit informed him that they sensed the High Mage's power in Hyperion also helps to round out the picture. Knowing that Archis is already looking into her disappearance is terrible news for her, but the good news is, is that Del is willing to assist her in remaining concealed. 
afterwards, he reveals that the Emperor summoned all the Empire's doctors and magicians as she slept. But this time, instead of losing his temper and killing everyone, the Emperor remained composed. His point is that Anisha, as the third star, will undoubtedly change the fate of the Empire's harshness. He then clutches her hand and feels honored to have devoted his life to her. The Emperor arrives at night, just as the twins are pressuring her to reveal what she discussed with Del. She can't help but feel awful for her father after hearing Del's story earlier, so she decides to thank him by sleeping with him tonight. The twin princes go on an angry tirade about why Anisha will sleep with her father, and Rochelle wants to go along with it so they can share the Emperor's bed. However, Anisha quickly ends the argument by telling them that she will sleep with them later and that for the time being, she will just sleep with their father. On their way to the Emperor's chamber, she finds out that Hellard had a tantrum after she collapsed, destroying her palace, so her father suggests that she sleep with him till she gets well. The following day, the doctor updates the Emperor on her progress, telling him that she'll be sleeping a lot and will completely recover with regular meals and medication. A cold breeze wakes her up in the middle of the night and snowflakes land on her cheeks. She is startled to see Cahel in a spirit form, with white-colored hair. He begins to talk to her, asking if she remembers him and expressing concern that she might forget him. When she sees his sadness through his eyes, she touches his cheeks, telling him not to cry, and he blushes before vanishing into thin air. Upon waking up, she looks around to check if seeing Cahel was only a dream, but the sight of snowflakes on her hand serves as a sign that what transpired was indeed true. Reading about Jadkar, Anisha learns that only snow and ice existed at the beginning and that Jadkar discovered a beautiful silver wolf while exploring the continent. Because of worldly wars, an arrow and sword murdered Jadkar's longtime friend, the silver wolf. As Jadkar mourned over his bloody companion, a huge silver wolf appeared and told him he was the spirit of snow and ice. After burying his only friend, the mysterious being asks him for any wishes, and he begs for strength to avenge his friend. The Silver Wolf gave Jadkar powers and froze his bleeding heart, which fueled his rage, and he drenched his hands in the blood of those who killed his buddy, becoming the ruler of the frozen region with his Silver Wolf banner. Anisha is done reading the founding myth of Jadkar, and she believes it is similar to what she knows, but she is adamant that the energy emanating from Cahill the night before was not magic, and it was also unique from the evil energy that Beluan possessed. Instead, she attributes it to the spirit's might, as it managed to evade the palace's strict security procedures. She begins to wonder why he approaches her and says unusual things to her. While Cahel is sleeping, he begins having a nightmare, remembering how he played with his puppy when his stepmother and brother appeared. Mrs. Cartina creeps behind Cahill, telling him that he is being disobedient, so he quickly apologizes, pleading not to hurt his puppy. But his brother, Asion, only laughs, and they butcher the puppy in front of him. Cahel cries for his friend and asks why they are mistreating him after he did everything they asked and didn't pursue the family riches or throne, but their laughing sounds are all he receives. Upon waking up, he breathes heavily but takes comfort in the jewelry Anisha gave him, remembers her pleasant face, and is glad that she remembers him. Suddenly, mystical voices ask about his wish-making experience and encourage him to make more wishes. He calmly instructs them to halt and walks to the window to daydream about Anisha, the light in his life. Del is loving his new routine of picking up Anisha and walking together to the library for their magic lessons. He then tells her that Archus diplomats arrived the other day, and they all seem to be very interested in her because they now know that she is the first Hyperion born with magical abilities. Nevertheless, she intends to stay in her palace, as she doesn't think anything positive will come from meeting them. When Anisha inquires about any more intriguing news, he muses for a bit and remembers that the mages in the palace are looking into a peculiar incident in which the trees in the Golden Forest froze, as there could be no other explanation for the occurrence beyond magic. Despite her belief in Cahel's abilities, she is taken aback when he informs her that the mages from Arches suspect that she may have used her magic to accomplish it. She refrains from commenting further out of fear of exposing Cahel and making things difficult for him. The Emperor and the Twin Princes discuss how Anisha needs friends, as advised by Countess Rushfeld, because children her age need to build friendships. These boys know nothing about friendship, so they all remain silent for a while before the Emperor suggests that they can find the little princess's friends, given that it is what she needs, and they all nod in agreement. Three days later, Anisha is hosting a tea party for girls her age, like a whole bunch of crybabies. As she struggles to deal with the situation, her father comes over to see how she's enjoying herself. 
However, things get worse when the girls start crying at the sight of the Emperor's menacing face. So Anisha persuades him to return to work, leaving the girls still reeling from their emotions. Anisha tries to comfort them, but the girls start to leave, leaving only one girl with her. She approaches the girl with the intention of having a conversation with her, but as she gets closer, the girl purposely knocks over the teacup, causing it to fall. The maid arrives to clean up, but instead of taking responsibility, she plays dumb and accuses Anisha. Anisha chooses to remain calm while her furious brother Hellard shows up out of nowhere and tries to assault the deceitful girl. Elder brother, let's go! The Hyperion bloodline is known for their might, and people often regarded them as gods. But they were also feared due to their predatory nature, and the twins are no exception. Their views, however, shifted dramatically with Anisha's birth, particularly on the night the twins murdered her would-be killer. She gives them warmth, smiles at them even though they reek of blood, and it is the first time they've felt loved. Aww. That explains why these two boys are so protective of her and have been watching her the entire time she's been at her first tea party. They are more focused than a CCTV and saw that the tea was purposefully spilled by Marquess Iliosa's daughter. Rochiel intends to discuss this with the Marquess, but Hellard appears to be impatient and has already confronted the lady. The party is over thanks to Hellard, and he is now getting a lecture from Rochiel, who believes that no young ladies would ever visit Anisha again because he scared them away. Hellard is so adorable as he listens intently and regrets what he did, while Anisha is relieved to have a normal brother like Rochiel, or so she thought. This normal brother of hers has already devised ten distinct plans to bring down the entire Iliosa family. He really said handle everything with class. <laughs> Hellard then apologizes to Anisha for spoiling the party, but our girl is actually relieved that she will never have to do this again, so she pats her brother on the head and thanks him for defending her. He rushes over to embrace her, and the three of them carry on with their tea party, enjoying each other's company. I love them so much. Their sweet moment is cut short when a servant shows up to tell them that the Archis's magicians have asked to meet with Anisha. The fact that the magicians seek Anisha's time without first scheduling an appointment irritates the twins, who believe the mages are quite proud of themselves. But as an aspiring mage, Anisha persuades her brothers that meeting them is for the best. Actually, she just wants to meet them once in order to put them to rest, as she fears that the Archist mages will do something much worse just to see her. Among the arts mages who have come with Head Mage Del is Teneripe, whom Anisha remembers from when he was a tiny child who aspired to be just like her. She smiles proudly at him while the twins reveal their menacing side as they confront the mages, wanting to know why they want to meet the princess. As the group's official spokesman, Teneripe reveals that, upon discovering the princess's magical abilities, they intend to teach her magic themselves, as they are the greatest. But just as Teneripe is about to elaborate, Hellard interrupts him, obviously uninterested in his proposal, hence, Anisha chooses to handle the mages before the situation escalates and someone dies. She approaches the mages, and Teneripe tries to persuade her of their pure intention to teach her magic but she is aware that their true goal is to examine her until they discover her link to the High Mage. Anisha then rejects their offer, asserting that she's already exceptionally gifted and does not require their assistance. Meanwhile, Beluan is witnessing all of this at Arches in real time, and the rain today is reminding him of the first time he met the High Mage. Beluan is from the Lagos family, whose blood can summon dark familiars, and he was on the run that day when he got surrounded by what appeared to be soldiers who were intending to kill him. After cutting himself with a knife, he called two familiars, who eliminated his assailants and left no evidence of their presence. He was near death from exhaustion when the High Wizard, who had been sent to kill him, appeared out of nowhere and offered him a helping hand. Beluan really wants her to come back to take responsibility for rescuing him. She is so beloved by everyone. Today, she's having her magic classes with Del. No, she's teaching Del a magical formula to improve the Empire's defense system. After their lessons, Del reports to her that the Archis mages are quiet these days after she arrogantly shooed them away during her tea party. To tell you more about what happened that day, Anisha referred to herself as a prodigy while smirking, leaving the wizard stunned while the twins couldn't stop laughing. She knows how much pride Archis mages have in their magical abilities, so hearing an arrogant remark from her was bound to hurt their egos, and the twins laughing at them made it worse, so they left annoyed that day. She has nothing much on her mind these days other than her art homework. Rochelle is engrossed in his paperwork when Anisha walks in to ask for his help with her drawing, and her cutie brother gladly jumps at the chance to be of service to his little sister. 
Her goal is to get her homework done fast before Hellard comes, and thankfully, she does so just in time. Hellard storms into the room, upset with Rochelle for spending too much time with Anisha, and offers to teach her sword fighting. But she isn't interested, as once her powers return, she will be the one protecting them. Anisha is now eating with the Emperor when she accidentally sends the meat flying over to her father. Well, her number one slave to her cuteness isn't angry at all, and even feeds her, and Anisha's joy radiates as she dances with her adorable feet. That night, as the Emperor puts her to bed, she is startled awake by a rattling sound and discovers that she is in a wagon, bound by a magical shackle around her neck. Who dared kidnap our baby? There was that day when the Emperor read of the recent disappearances of children who had been sold as slaves. He then had a serious chat with Anisha and told her that if she was ever kidnapped, she didn't need to fight and should tell her captor that the Emperor is willing to give them anything, even the Empire, as long as she is alive. She didn't take it seriously at the time, but now she can't believe she'll be kidnapped. Nobody dared to touch her after the Quantia battle, so now she's trying to figure out who would have the guts to abduct her, knowing full well that doing so would lead to their own tragic end. However, she admits that whoever the kidnapper is must be very powerful since he managed to breach the palace's defenses. She then finds a magic run that blocks all sound, and it seems so familiar that she immediately realizes who the abductor is. But her thoughts are interrupted as Cahel appears in spirit form. He rushes over to see how she is doing, and upon discovering the magical regulator slung over her neck, he becomes enraged, causing his powers to spiral out of control and nearly freezing the place. Anisha has no choice but to slap him to get his attention, and she urges him to keep focused. Cahel's power stopped, but he now appears droopy after being scolded, which Anisha notices. However, she doesn't have time to consult him, so she hastily wraps a piece of her clothing around his wrist and orders him to check outside to see where they're headed, and then report it to her family. Cahel is taken aback and does not want to leave her alone, but Anisha knows that even if he stays with her, he would not be able to defeat her kidnappers. After a brief moment of reflection, he realizes he has no choice but to comply with her request and assures her he will return. When she gets to the kidnapper's lair, she finds that her suspicions were correct. Noxita and Beluan are the ones responsible for the abduction. Even before Anisha reaches the lair, Noxita is concerned that the evil group they are collaborating with will do anything to harm Anisha. He begins overthinking that he receives a slap from Beluan, who is confident in his careful plan of kidnapping. Okay, it appears that Noxita is the goofy one, while Beluan is the serious one. Arches opened their gates for Hyperion so that they could enter the Hyperion Palace, and now he is using the resistance organization that despises the Empire as scapegoats if something goes wrong with his plan. Beluan notices Noxita's admiration for the princess, which is unusual because Noxita has no interest in anyone. He too finds it odd that he feels something for the princess, which gives him hope that his assumption that the young princess is the high mage is true. This just shows how strong their bond is with her. Back in the present, they are amazed that Anisha isn't crying, and even has the strength to demand that they remove the magical restraining necklace that is wrapped around her, which they do. Now that Anisha can breathe properly, she smiles at them and greets them like old friends. Meanwhile, the mood in the palace has become eerie, seeing our boys' long faces. I got so used to seeing them bubbly. Rochelle has already declared a state of emergency in their empire, and the top mage has reported to the Emperor that the Empire's defenses have been destroyed from within, leading him to suspect that the kidnappers are high-level mages. Hellard also enters the Emperor's office, reporting that he has already imprisoned all personnel from Anisha's palace and will begin interrogation. He is convinced that it is the work of allied forces opposed to their empire, and he wishes to investigate it himself. But the Emperor refuses. Given that they have destroyed the opposition, the organization has lost its power and has nothing to lose. Therefore, provoking them will only hurt Anisha. Thankfully, Rodgo is still thinking straight. Well, he is the Emperor after all. Given that only an exceptional person can breach their defenses, they know the Allied forces are collaborating with someone. So the Emperor orders the twins and Dell to investigate while he leads his army in search of the Allied forces. The Emperor is now on his way when Cahill stops his horse and hands Anisha's cloth stating that he knows where the princess is. Noxita is now sobbing as he cuddles Anisha, while Beluan is being all Sundare over in the corner. The fact that they recognize her regardless of her appearance makes her feel loved, but it also implies that they will likely hold on to her now. After hearing Anisha's story, they begin to question who had Arches planned to hurt her. The person sealed her magic, her original body disappeared, and her soul moved to Hyperion. But what frustrates her the most is that her powers are returning at a snail's pace. 
Beluan then advises that they return to Arches right now so that he can start investigating her sealed powers, and that despite her appearance, he is confident that everyone will accept her. However, Anisha is unable to leave at this time and believes it is best for them to clarify her death and find a replacement, which surprised Noxita but enraged Beluan. He starts to think that their high mage has become too attached to her new family and is now abandoning them, which is unbelievable, and he is determined to bring her to Arches even by force. They are cut short when the door begins to bang, prompting Beluan to speak with the allied forces outside. These nobles are trying to rush him to give them Anisha, causing Beluan to unleash a sinister aura that makes them all cower in fear, compelling them to wait. The reason behind this is that they have a deal wherein the Allied Force can do anything they want to the princess once Beluan is done speaking to her. Returning to the chamber, Beluan reassures Anisha that the Allied soldiers are merely a convenient scapegoat for his abduction of her. Then he goes on to say that his decision to take her to Arches is final, even if it means making Hyperion their enemy. Anisha gets up and uses her authority as a high mage to stop Beluan from making decisions on his own. Thankfully, Noxita follows her orders, but he does point out that Arches will be ready for her return still, which means Beluan has little choice but to let her go as well. However, Beluan tells her that the next time that they meet, she must choose between Arches and Hyperion. Anisha's next concern is that these mages did not prepare an escape plan without her, so she discusses her idea because she is certain that once the Emperor arrives, only she will leave the place alive. Meanwhile, the head of the Allied army is just sitting tight until Beluan hands over the princess. The leader is actually the ruler of a fallen nation that Emperor Rodgo destroyed, and it is when he is on the verge of death that Beluan appears and offers the kidnapping. At last, as agreed upon, Noxita and Beluan hand over the princess to them. They have removed the magical restraint around Anisha's neck because it is an arch's device that they can't give, but they use magic to put the princess to sleep in compensation. They act so cooperative! <laughs> Beiluan suggests to the leader just before they depart that the best way to carry out his revenge would be to assassinate the princess in front of the emperor. The idea thrills the leader, but he also believes it's impossible. He is well aware of the emperor's power, and he will surely be chopped off before he can even touch the princess. Bad guys, you need not fear. As a parting present, Beiluan lends the allied force enough of his powers to withstand the emperor. They really have no idea they are being played. Following the mage's departure, the leader receives words that the Hyperion is on its way, and he can't wait to put his newfound abilities to use. Uh, all I can say is, may they rest in pieces. So guys, what do you think of this story so far? Please subscribe and turn on notifications for updates on this and all our other stories, so you can be the first to find out when they're out. Thank you so much for your support. See you in the next one!